In this video, I will discuss several Pokemon that no player should ever use in a casual Pokemon Red, Blue or Yellow playthrough. What I mean by a casual playthrough is that I will not take into account if the game is being nuzlocked or randomized. My goal is to take an objective look at every available Pokemon in these games under normal circumstances. Quick disclaimer, by the way, it's not my goal to bash on your favorite Pokemon. If you want to use a certain Pokemon that is on this list, then nothing is stopping you to do so. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the criteria I'll be using to make decisions. Availability Role in game Move pool and TM usage the Niches and being outclassed Version exclusivity Gen 1 mechanics and bugs I will sort the Pokemon featured in this video into categories. It will make the whole thing more organized. Now, it's finally time to get into what Pokemon you should never use in a Pokemon Red, Blue or Yellow playthrough. The first group consists of Pokemon that are available in the early to mid game, without a significant niche that to make them stand out. Or, in other words, they're outclassed by their competition. The first one is Marowak. It faces tough competition from every other ground type Pokemon, except for Onyx. They're all available before Marowak 2, which makes it even worse. Marowak's stats are either equal to or lower than Sand Slashes, so it's basically a worse version. I was surprised to find out that it learns a lot of special moves, which it can't use with a special stat of 50. Just wait for health items to be introduced in the next set of games Marowak, but for these games, you should never be used over other ground types. Next is Lickitung. Why should you never use it? Well, it becomes available in the mid-game as a trade in the gate between Route 18 and Fusha City. The thing is, there are plenty of other normal types that you can catch before that point in the game. This includes Radicate, who's a very good Pokemon in the early to mid-game. And then there's Snorlax, one of the best Gen 1 Pokemon who is catchable just before Lickitung. On top of that, the NPC requests a Slowbro, another great Pokemon for a playthrough, so it's not worth giving up for a Lickitung. It does not learn any notable moves that set it apart from the competition, it doesn't have good stats, and it's outperformed by pretty much every other normal type available in these games. In Pokemon Yellow, it is tucked far away in Corulean Cave a post-game dungeon, so regular trainers don't have to witness its mediocrity. Lickitung is a wasted slot in a Pokedex, and that is why you should never use one. Next up is Porygon. It can learn a wide range of moves, including powerful special attacks with the help of TMs. However, Porygon is not gonna make much use of these powerful attacks with its low stats. You're better off using Clefable, who can learn all of the same moves and has a higher base stat total. The only thing Porygon has over Clefable is a self-healing move in Recover. But if you are someone who uses healing items, Recover is a wasted move slot. The game corner is the only way to obtain Porygon. It's locked behind a hefty price of 8300 coins in Pokemon Blue and 9 1999 coins in Pokemon Red and Yellow. That's money you can spend on the aforementioned healing items. You should never use a Porygon just for that last bit alone. Wigglytuff is just a budget Clefable. They get the exact same moves and the only thing that Wigglytuff has over Clefable is more HP. A lot of it. And this in exchange for lower stats in every other stat, except attack. I know Clefairy is a rare encounter in Mount Moon, but you should stumble upon one naturally. If not, it's a cheap buy at the game corner. Clefable can even carry its own weight throughout the whole game. Just don't waste your Moonstone on Wigglytuff. Continuing on with everyone's favorite joke Pokemon in Gen 1, Farfetch'd. Again, it is also obtained in a trade for a Sparrow, something that you should keep and evolve for a better version of Farfetch'd. It has all the tools to be a great setup sweeper, but sadly, its stats don't allow it to do any of that consistently. Farfetch'd can potentially make use of the batch boost glitch, but the increased trade EXP will level up Farfetch'd pretty frequently. 
which nullifies the glitch. If you want to have some fun, go ahead, but it's simply outclassed by other flying and normal types. That's why you should never use it. Speaking of other flying types, Pidgeot is a Pokemon that a lot of people have used as their first flying type, including me. Though, looking statistically, it is outclassed by Ferro and Dodrio in its final evolution stage. Sparrow and Pidgey are found very close to each other in the wild. While Pidgey evolves two levels earlier into Pidgeotto at level 18, its middle stage evolution, Sparrow evolves into Ferro at level 20 and has the stats of a Pidgeot, Pidgey's final evolution that you can only get at level 36. By that time, you can get a Dodrio, who's even better than Ferro. Pidgeot has slightly more bulk than the other two, but the difference isn't enough to consider using it over them. Oh, and Pidgeot misses out on Drill Pack. So, Fly and Sky Attack are its best flying step options. Final verdict, Pidgeot is outclassed by another early game bird and a mid game bird, and that's why you should never use it at any part in the game. Now, for some Pokémon that are just at the bottom of the barrel alongside Lickitung and Porygon. You might remember Onyx from the anime being this colossal, menacing rock snake. Sadly, it's a different story in the Gen 1 games. First off, it's available near the mid-game in Rock Tunnel, that is two gyms after you get Geodude, another rock ground type. Onyx has one of the highest defense stats in the game with 160 defense. If you look at its other stats though, 45 base attack? Geodude has nearly double of that. Hell, even their HP and special stats almost match. The only thing that Onyx has over Geodude is speed and defense. But that doesn't matter, because Geodude will already be evolved by the time you get Onyx. Even if you can't get a Golem by trading, Graveler still outshines Onyx in every way. Onyx shares the throne with Lickitung and Porygon of being one of the worst and most useless Pokémon in Gen 1. Another Pokémon worthy of being the very worst, Hitmonchan. He's just not up to par when you compare him to other fighting types, not even Machoke. But doesn't Hitmonchan have all of the elemental punches? Yes, but they're not physical moves in Gen 1. Do you also know how high his special stat is? 35. That's fucking abysmal. It's on par with Pidgey. He has Body Slam and Submission as his main attacking moves, just like Pinsir, who may or may not appear later in this video. Hitmonchan is obtained as a gift where you have to choose between him and Hitmonlee. Not only does Hitmonlee learn a proper fighting type attack without recoil damage, it also learns Meditate to boost its attack and other stats thanks to the Batch Boost glitch. You'll be decent in a few generations Hitmonchan, but for now, no one should ever use you in the OG games. Tangela is the final grass type that you can get between the 6th and 7th gym. That means it only has a good matchup against Giovanni and Bruno. If you're after a grass type for your team, then catch an Oddish or Bellsprout in the early game, or go for Execute in the mid game. Tangela has good stats, but it's just available too late with too few good matchups left. And that's enough for a reason not to use it. Just like Tangela, Aerodactyl becomes available after getting access to Surf. It's one of the fastest Pokémon in the game, but that doesn't mean a lot if you can't set yourself apart from the already quick normal flying types. Fly is the only good stab it can learn, which is not super impressive and its coverage moves exist of Hyper Beam, Fire Blast and Double Edge. While Aerodactyl can make big holes in the opponent's team with these moves, Ferro and Dojiro can do it just as well and maybe even faster without wasting turns on Fly. It's kinda funny, since this basically means Aerodactyl is a late game bird that's part rock type. When you revive Aerodactyl, it comes at level 30 and has a slow EXP rate. I don't see a good reason to grind it to a proper level this late into the game, especially if you can catch similar Pokémon way earlier. Due to Aerodactyl's late availability and shallow move pool, I deem it worthy of being never used in a RBY playthrough. Now, for the first and only fully evolved Dragon type in Gen 1, Dragonite. This is actually a very good Pokémon. You can catch Dratini in the Safari Zone with a Super Rod, so that puts it in the mid-game. Dragonite can learn a lot of strong moves including Fire Blast, Blizzard, Thunder, Surf, Rep, Agility and Hyper Beam. 
Wait, why am I giving it so much praise? This is supposed to be a negative video. Look, the evolution requirement is the goddamn problem here. Dragonair will be part of your team up until the Pokemon League, because it only evolves at level 55. This alone is enough of a reason to ignore this powerful dragon. It soaks up too much EXP and Dragonair itself isn't very powerful for late game battles. Just use Nidoking or Clefable if you want special or mixed attackers. Now, I will talk about Pokemon that are actually pretty good Good, but they're outclassed by even better Pokemon. Mr. Mime is just like Lickitung, only obtainable by trading a Pokemon that is better kept for yourself. Abra is the Pokemon that the NPC requests, which is the first stage of the best psychic type of Gen 1. Even if trading isn't an option and you're stuck with Kadabra, it's still a very solid choice for a playthrough and arguably superior to Mr. Mime. The only thing Mime has going for it is slightly more defense. But why do you need that if you're gonna narrowly one-shot everything anyway? Even with the increased EXP gain, I wouldn't pick it over a Pokemon that learns Psychic without the need of ATM. So in essence, why opt for Mr. Mime when its competition or the Psychic types simply do the job better? Now for Kingler. This thing is essentially a physical normal type attacker stuck as a water type. It has a whopping 130 attack and 115 defense, though all of its other stats kinda suck. Kingler can dish out some serious damage with Body Slam and Hyper Beam after using Sword Stance. It also has the privilege to learn a signature move, Crab Hammer. It's a 90 BP water type move with 85 accuracy that almost has a guaranteed chance to strike as a critical hit. This sounds quite overpowered on paper. But the catch here is that Kingler has a measly 50 special stat, so it won't be dishing out too much damage with it. The chance to miss is also quite annoying, especially with Surf being a very strong alternative for other water types. In my opinion, Kingler is not worth using over Kabutops or Gyarados, who offer more versatility in terms of stats and moves. Seedra, Golduck and Seeking are mono water types that don't bring anything exclusive to the table compared to all of the other water types. All three of them have a rather balanced stat distribution that can be compared to the one from Blastoise. Depending on the Pokemon that's being compared, Blastoise can have up to 40 more points in its base stat total. So if we simply look at the numbers, Blastoise performs better overall. Vaporeon is another pure water type with excellent HP and special. In terms of tankiness and damage dealing, it outclasses these three water types. The only thing that barely sets Seedra and Seeking apart is agility to raise their speed. But I honestly don't see the point if you can use faster water types that have more power behind them. All mono water types run the same two offensive moves, while most most dual water type Pokemon have more options to pick from most of the time. There's really no reason to miss out on using, for example, a Gyarados or Vaporeon over these three. The next group is a duo of rare Safari Zone Pokemon, Kangaskhan and Chansey. The catching mechanics of the Safari Zone make them a pain in the ass to catch. In Pokemon Red and Blue, Tauros is no different from these two. It's just as rare and difficult to catch. But in Pokemon Yellow, Kangaskhan and Tauros have increased encounter rates, somewhat making up for their rarity in the Red and Blue games. However, I believe Kangaskhan is strictly worse than Tauros, so besides being rare, it is also not as good. Then that leaves us with Chansey. Despite its fantastic HP, special stat and move pool, it just isn't worth using over Snorlax, Clefable or even Wigglytuff. Moreover, Chansey is even harder to encounter and catch in the Safari Zone compared to Kangaskhan and Tauros. Even if you manage to snag one, other Pokemon that serve similar roles are available much earlier in the game without the hassle of the Safari Zone mechanics. To summarize, Kangaskhan, Chansey and Tauros are pretty great Pokemon to use in a Pokemon RBY playthrough, though their rarity and catch rate make them less favorable choices compared to other Pokemon with similar roles. I do have to note that Tauros can be a worthy party member in Pokemon Yellow due to its increased encounter 
character rates in that game. Before I continue on to the next group, I want to talk a bit about the electric types of Kanto. It was very difficult for me to decide which one was the worst of the bunch, but I think I managed to nail it down. Out of all of the electric types, Electabuzz seems to be the one you should avoid using for a playthrough. Electabuzz is one of the final obtainable electric types in these games. The biggest problem is its late availability compared to other electric type Pokemon, but there's more. Most electric types can only deal meaningful damage by spamming Thunderbolt or they just spread paralysis, because their move pools are kinda limited. Electabuzz is sort of an outlier here. It can learn quite a few things through TMs, which can possibly give it a niche. Though, first off, I wouldn't want to wait such a long time to teach these moves when better Pokemon that appear earlier in the game can use them. And secondly, Electabuzz's balanced stat distribution leaves much to be desired. Compared to other electric types, its power doesn't even match up against Magneton and the top tier Jolteon. Electrode, surprisingly, has only 5 less points in special, and a lot more speed. So it will be dealing more damage overall with the highest critical hit chance in the game. Then that leaves us with the early game Raichu, who shares a similar stat distribution with Electabuzz. The only thing it has over Raichu is access to Psychic, but you're honestly better off giving it to something with more special. In conclusion, Electabuzz has a niche with its broad move pool as an electric type Pokemon, but its damage output is quite lackluster for a Pokemon that's only available late into the game. Now I'm gonna introduce to not one Pokemon, but nearly every Pokemon that has the bug typing. These are Venomoth, Parasect, Scyther and Pinsir. You're probably wondering why Beedrill and Butterfree aren't mentioned. That's because these two are obtainable at the start of the game and evolve very early. Their stats are high enough for the entirety of the early game. The four other bug types don't have the luxury of being strong early game Pokemon. They become available at a point where there are many other strong options that outperform them in their roles and niches. The first bugs to squash are Paris and Parasect. They are also early game Pokemon found in Mount Moon, but by then you will already have a fully evolved bug type. Shortly after Mount Moon, you can catch either Oddish or Bellsprout, who greatly outperform Paris and Parasect in their damage output and supporting capabilities. It doesn't help that Bug Grass is one of the worst typings to ever exist, especially on a Pokemon this slow and frail. It's sad to see that Spore, an exclusive sleep-inducing move with 100% accuracy, is wasted on this Pokemon. Venomoth can basically do the same thing as Parasect, but with a lot more speed and without the 3 quad weaknesses. Venomoth is a Bug Poison type two types that it doesn't make use of offensively. Usually you see this Pokemon with Sleep Powder, Stun Spore, Psychic and a filler move. You know what else does this exactly? Executor. One of the better Pokemon in the game. And they become available at the same time. Executor boasts the powerful Psychic type on top of its Grass typing, so it can actually use Psychic with Stab. Its stats are also a lot higher, except for its speed which isn't too bad for a playthrough. One thing that Venomoth has over Executor is that Executor needs a TM to learn Psychic, while Venomoth learns it naturally at level 50. But that means you're stuck with Psybeam for a long while if you don't use the Psychic TM. Then we come to our physical bug type attackers, Scyther and Pinsir. Scyther does have the flying type as a secondary type, but it doesn't benefit from it in any way. Both of them have similar stats, with Scyther having more speed and slightly more HP. Pinsir, on the other hand, has more attack and defense. Their move pool is almost identical. I believe Pinsir outperforms Scyther in its slash, spamming and sweeping capabilities. So what I am going to say about Pinsir from here on also counts towards Scyther. So, Pinsir. The notable moves you learn are Slash, Swords Dance, Body Slam, Submission and Hyper Beam. Where are the bug type moves in your arsenal? 
You can't even hit the ghastly line. They're immune to all of your moves. Now let's dissect this bug. Let's start with Slash, a move that basically has a 100% chance to crit. There are many other Pokemon that can abuse this move, alongside actual good coverage. They also learn this move a lot earlier than Pinsir. Then that leaves Pinsir with Swords Dance's sweeping potential. I want to argue here that Sand Slash is the better Swords Dance user. Pinsir and Sand Slash surprisingly have a similar stat spread with Sand Slash's base stat total being a bit lower, though Sand Slash makes up for that by having a superior typing, early availability, a broader move pool, and better matchups. Alright, let's wrap up this section. In a nutshell, Parasect is one of the worst Pokemon in the game. It and Venomoth are outclassed by grass types like Executor and Victory Bell. Pinsir does everything that Scyther can do better, though there are simply better Pokemon to use that are catchable way earlier in the game. And that is why you should never use Parasect, Venomoth, Scyther and Pinsir. Also, fun fact, Jolteon and Beedrill are the only two Pokemon that have a decent bug type move. Why don't other bug types get these moves? Another group of Pokemon that share the same type. Golbat, Arbok, Weezing and Muk. All poison types. These Pokemon are quite bad for a playthrough. It's mostly the fault of the poison type not being well thought out in this generation. None of them have a strong stab move. The best some get is Sludge, so most of them are mostly reliant on their coverage, which is quite shallow. I'm gonna divide them in two groups, the early game crowd and the late game crowd. The late game crowd consists of Muk and Weezing, who become available at the Cinnabar Mansion. At this point in the game, there are only a few important fights left. Weezing and Muk don't do particularly well in these fights and they don't provide anything else besides that. Muk and Weezing have the benefit of learning a few special TM moves like Fire Blast, Thunderbolt and Mega Drain, but so do the Nidos, the best poison types in the game. Then the early game crowd is left with the Golbat and Arbok. Zubat is such a hassle to train as it only learns incredibly weak and horrible moves in the early game. You're stuck with Leech Life and Bite until you get Double Edge or Mega Drain as a TM. There's no reason to use it over Pharaoh or even Farfetch'd, but I said you shouldn't use that so I better follow my own advice. Arbok has the unique trait of being able to paralyze ground types with Glare, but honestly, why would you paralyze ground types with a poison type that's just asking to get KO'd? Sending out your water type is always the better play. I guess it can also make use of Toxic and Rep to slowly take out opponents? It's way more efficient to use standard attacks in a casual playthrough. You can teach it Dig, Rock Slide and Earthquake, surprisingly, though at that point you're better off giving those TMs to other Pokemon. So, what it breaks down to for these poison types is that Weezing and Muk become available way too late. Golbat is just an all-around terrible Pokemon and Arbok has potential, but it's outclassed by the Nidos. Because of these reasons, you should never use Weezing, Muk, Golbat and Arbok in your playthrough. Let's talk about the fire types of Kento now. They're a bit of a head scratcher, to be honest. Stat wise, they are not bad. It's more so that they're not very useful in the Kanto region. Their best step options are learned pretty late into the game, with most of them learning Flamethrower at around level 50. And the only fire type TM that can make up for that is Fire Blast, obtained from the 7th gym when you're close to almost learning Flamethrower. There is one exception to this, Vulpix. If you don't evolve it too early into Ninetales, Vulpix can learn Flamethrower at level 35. There is a trade-off though, Vulpix struggles a lot by only having access to Ember early on. Flareon is also one of the Pokemon that learns Flamethrower at a late level, but it can at least run a mixed set thanks to its high attack and special stats. Flareon can use Body Slam effectively, which is something that Ninetales can't do. Those early, high offensive stats really save Flareon from appearing as a bad entry. So besides Charizard, Flareon and Ninetales can be decent alternatives if you're determined to use a fire type in Kento, but it might be wiser to rely on flying and fighting types to counter the types that fire excels at. I don't have many great things to say about other fire types, let's see why. Rapidash has an awful move pool and it's only available in the Cinnabar Mansion. 
it relies on fire spin and body slam until you get the fire blast TM in the late game. There's no flamethrower to speak of here. Flareon's attack and special stats are also higher. Rapidash can only out damage it with its 20% to land critical hits. Magmar is also home to Cinnabar Mansion, but it actually gets okay coverage. It is the only fire type in Kanto that can learn Psychic with ATM. I guess Submission is also a coverage option, but I don't know why you would ever use this move over Seismic Toss. Despite having a decent move pool, it's just not viable enough due to its late availability and balanced stat distribution. It's better to use Flareon, Charizard or Arcanine. Speaking of Arcanine, this good boy has it really rough. You're stuck with Growlithe until level 50 if you want Flamethrower. Otherwise, Fire Blast from Blaine will have to suffice. It's not worth investing TM moves for coverage just to get Flamethrower. Growlithe will fall off too quickly because of its low stats. And to top it off in yellow, it is stuck in Cinnabar Mansion. The late availability and proper access to stab are the real killers for these fire types. And also, like I said earlier, they're not very useful in the Kanto region. Just use Charizard, Ninetales or Flareon if you really want a fire type. There's one final Pokemon I want to discuss. It's the absolute worst Pokemon for a playthrough. I mean, it's Ditto. Why would you ever want to waste a turn copying the opponent's Pokemon? Don't use it. Oh my god, I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. I didn't expect this video to be so long. Originally, I only had half of the Pokemon that appeared, many more got added as I was writing the script. One day, I definitely want to look at the Gen 2 games with the same premise as this video. If you enjoyed this content, then please leave a like and let me know if you want to see more. And if you do, subscribe to my channel. Until next time. Have a good one.